Hey everyone, this is George from DinosaurGeorge.com. So sorry it's taking me so long to get to these things. Hang on a minute. Mmm. Ooh, she's hot. <laughs> she's really hot. Um, I've spent the last uh, month and a half traveling all over Texas, speaking at libraries, trying to promote reading, and I have logged about 9,800 miles doing that. I still have a month and a half left, and ideally I hope I can really motivate young people to get out there and read because being a good reader is incredibly important and I feel very strongly about that. So I apologize for taking so long, but let's dive into it. First, before we get started, item of the day is item 3717, can be found on my website. This thing is cool. This is a, a, claw, a cast of a Spinosaurus claw and it's pretty incredible. I like this piece a lot because it's one of the larger claws, but I really like about it is it's relatively thick. Most claws are, are somewhat thin, but I like the, the contour of this one. I think it's really cool. For a lot of you, you'll see sort of that, that valley, that indentation that runs there. That's basically where blood uh, vessels were that brought nutrients to the nail. See, when this animal was alive, there would have been a nail covering the top of this. It didn't look like this. And that's what that is. So for some of you, when you look at something and you're not sure if you're looking at a claw or a tooth, the fastest and most easily, easy, easy way to recognize it, look for that little thin valley that runs in there and that will tell you. All right, let's go. Uh, Andrea from Budapest, Hungary. Hi, DG. Hey, Andrea. Apologize for drinking, but my throat is killing me today. What do you think about the new discovery of ornithischian dinosaurs that, can, that were feathered? It means, does this mean that ceratopsians and hadrosaurs would have been feathered as well? Or could it only be a characteristic of small bipedal animals? You know, Andrea, um, all the new information being released about these feathered dinosaurs, I do think that sometimes we jump to conclusions. We paint with a very broad brush. We find something new and then we begin to apply that too wildly over the terrain. I, I don't know if every dinosaur was feathered, but let me say this. When I say we, we over, um, maybe over exaggerate or expand on the evidence, I'm not necessarily referring to the paleontologist. So, most of the time, this is perpetuated by the media who wants something to be sensationalized. And so they ask questions in a way that gets them the answer that they're looking for. And the paleontologist suddenly sits back and sees the interview and says, I didn't say that. So it's not so much that I think paleontologists are overreacting to this notion that everything was feathered. I do believe that a lot of this is perpetuated by the media who's trying to make something glamorous and sexy and sound really cool. Uh, now, I did have the opportunity, I will say this about seven years ago, I had the opportunity to look at a triceratops that had fossilized skin impression, beautiful mummified skin, and it did appear to have quill points, meaning where large feathers would attack, much like an ostrich. If you've ever seen the skin of an ostrich, it has those big, large points where quill, big feathers attached to it. And that's what this Triceratops had. Now, whether that means it had feathers, I don't know, but I can tell you it was certainly very intriguing to see. And um, uh, man, I, I would love to know, or I'd love to see more evidence to help support this notion that all dinosaurs were feathered. All right, my buddy George from Fleet, Hampshire, England. Hello, Mr. Blasting. It's George, your Facebook buddy here. Um, George, I always appreciate your courtesy, buddy, but you can call me George. You can, I mean, it's a great name. Who wouldn't want to be called George, right? Right? Uh, <laughs> but you can call me George, DG, whatever you want to call me, buddy. Um, I know your days have been busy, but I was wondering, are there any specific requirements to become a paleontologist, and how exactly do you become one like yourself? P.S. I hope you admire my dino drawings like I admire your work. There'll be plenty more of them to come. Thank you if you have time to answer. Um, Thanks so much. Well, listen, man, George, first of all, thank you for writing, and I do like your artwork. I think you are a spectacular young artist, and I can only imagine what your art is going to look like 20 years from now with all of the work that you put into it. Um, as for being a paleontologist, I hesitate calling myself a paleontologist only because I didn't go to school to get my degree in, in the field. Now, I've studied my entire life, and I've probably read 90% of all the textbooks out there and I think I could probably teach a course in paleontology. But the reason why I hesitate calling myself a paleontologist is because I don't want to take away from those people that work so hard to get that true name. 
I know the name paleontology, a paleontologist is kind of a, a broad description. If you study dinosaurs and you teach them for a living, then you're technically a professional paleontologist. But again, I, I try to leave some sort of distinction between those that work so hard in school to become true paleontologists and myself. Now, as for me, uh, I wish I would have taken a course in paleontology, but the way things ended up for me, they ended up very well. But I don't want people to follow my same path. My path was I was in a different field. I worked very hard. I worked seven days a week. I made a lot of money, but I didn't enjoy it. And back in um, 1997, I quit that career and I started doing paleontology full time because it's what I love. And what got me where I am has a lot to do with personality and my ability to speak publicly and communicate in a way that's easy to understand for the average person. So many paleontologists get so deep into, tech, uh, into technical information that they start to lose people because people don't know what they're talking about. So I think I sort of filled a little bit of an opening there that, that may uh, exist uh, with a lot of people in paleontology, and that is let them do the work, let them do all the research, and let them get the glory for what they do, and let me fill the role of communicating what they do to the average Joe, and that's kind of what I think I do. So I would suggest, George, that you look into college, determine what sort of paleontologists want to be. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of opportunities within this field, and maybe go to work in the summer for a, a museum, start to get some experience in it. Uh, volunteer your time as you get older to go out on dig sites and um, you can kind of get a better feel if that's what you wanna do. And if you do, brother, I hope you go out and get a degree. Don't follow in my footsteps because I can tell you it's a difficult way to get to where I am. It was a lot of hard work and some of it probably would have been easier had I been a degreed paleontologist. Uh, good to hear from you, George. All right, my friend Emma from Noblesville, Indiana, Emma. Hello, DG, guess who's back? Yes, I know, Emma. How you keep getting through my spam filters are beyond me. <laughs> I kid you, Emma, I kid you. All right, uh, and she says, I hope you're doing well and are happy and healthy. I am, Emma. I'm very healthy and I'm actually very, very happy. So thank you so much. He says as he has to take a drink to take care of his throat. As you know, or at least I think you do, I have a passion for Cedians, and I, lately I've been doing some research on prehistoric Cedians. Um, basically, those are swimming, mostly mammals, but also reptiles, pretty much anything that lives in the sea. I was wondering if you knew or believed that Bacillosaurus used echolocation like modern whales do. Woo! Thanks for everything, and see you on Friends Book. Oh, man. No, I'm never letting you live that down. That's great. Thank you for always bringing up the Friends Book thing. For those of you that don't know, one day, one day, I made the mistake. Okay, maybe 24 times I made the mistake of saying Friends Book instead of Facebook. And Emma cannot let that go. Thank you, Emma. Remember that claw I showed earlier? Yeah. Yeah, this thing could cause a lot of damage, Emma. Don't forget that. All right. <laughs> Could Bacillosaurus use echolocation? You know, my understanding of echolocation is that it's generated in the skull, but they, there oftentimes is a chamber where there's a fluid that is used to cause that, that, that force that sends out those waves. And I don't believe Bacillosaurus has that. Now, don't quote me on this because I'm not that familiar with it. I've seen Bacillosaurus skulls, but I don't know if they would have had that ability. Their skull is more like a monitor lizard skull in a way, in that there doesn't seem to be room for something that would allow for actual echolocation. To the best of my knowledge, uh, Emma, I don't think so. The other reason why that may not be necessary is its eyes are relatively large, and it's always found in what would have been a little more shallower water. So it suggests to me that they're using vision uh, versus echolocation as a way to find food. But that's a brilliant question, and I wish I knew 100% what the answer is. All right, my buddy Noah from Shippensburg, Pennsylvania. Hey, DG, I've got two questions. Hey, Noah, i got two answers. <laughs> I keep hearing theropod dinosaurs couldn't pronate their hands. Why? And do we have skin impression of Tyrannosaurus? Well, that pronation of the hands, meaning how could they, could they move their hands in some of the same feet, ways we do? Can we put them in? Can we move them out? Could they grasp? Well, based on their skeletal design of their arms, it doesn't appear like they had that ability. And that's why they're saying that, Noah. It's because the way the bones are fitted together, it doesn't allow for the same sort of motion and movement that we have. And therefore, they may not have been capable of doing certain things with their hands. As for the skin impression of Tyrannosaurus, the best of my knowledge, 
Uh, I don't know. You know, I've had a lot of people tell me they have found skin impression, but I haven't seen it myself, so I can't speak to that on a personal level. But uh, a couple of people, I, as a matter of fact, I think I've heard a couple of people say that they've seen it. So it's certainly possibly out there, and I would love to see it if it was. Finally, Martin from Lombard, Illinois. Hey, DG, how you been? I've been great, Martin. Hope you're doing well. Have you ever been concerned that a good portion of the paleo community doesn't share the same ambition of teaching the mainstream public about dinosaurs? And what can us as science enthusiasts do about it? Okay, Martin, let me explain something about paleontology. It's no different than any other science. You have individuals within there that work really, really hard with the public. They do everything they can to promote and share everything they know. Uh, I am fortunate to know a lot of those people. They spend a large amount of time. Look at Dr. Thomas Holtz Jr. You, when you go to his Facebook page, that man spends a huge amount of time communicating information to people so that they can understand what's going on. He's a prime example of how open and how sharing he is. Um, go to Whitmer's lab at Ohio. Um, here's a man that posts information constantly about his research and what they're doing and what the latest findings are. So these are people that spend a huge amount of time doing that. Now they're, like I said, it's like any other science. There's also jerks, <laughs> to, for lack of a better word. There's paleo jerks out there. Some of these folks kind of think paleontology is their own private club and they don't want outsiders to come in. They see the public as a nuisance, but most of them work for public entities like museums or universities that are oftentimes funded by the public. And yet they see them as a, as a uh, sort of a nuisance or a, a problem they wish would go away. Um, when, I, uh, when Jurassic Fight Club came out, I, f I got a load of who they were. Man, I, they even signed up, a group of them signed up to try to have me banned from television. <laughs> and it was mostly because I wasn't part of their group. They're like sheep. They follow each other and they, they only do what the, what the lead sheep says to do. You're going to find that in every industry on the planet. What I suggest you do is I dropped off of all of those mailing lists and all those groups because I got sick of listening to them complain about how somebody dared approach them with a question. My opinion is if you think you're that important, good for you. But I would ignore those folks. I would spend my time focusing on those avenues that give you that information. Uh, Facebook is a great way to find those kind of people. There are mailing lists out there. There are groups out there. I just say keep working hard, study what you can, look in every avenue, read every book you can get your hand on, and you'll be able to get all the answers for all the things that you want. Ignore the paleo jerks, they're out there, but no different than anything else. I mean, I was interested in astronomy once and, and discovered it's the same thing. And it's usually those people that haven't really accomplished much that are the biggest jerks. They try so desperately to be important. I hate that stuff. I don't know why it exists, but it does, and there's nothing we can do about it. So Martin, you keep looking at all the venues you can, and uh, I'm sure you'll continue to get all the information you need. For all of you out there, I appreciate it very much. I apologize again for not being able to get these out quickly. I'm gonna shoot another one real quick, and if my throat lasts, maybe I'll even shoot a third today, who knows? Uh, so, uh, for you young people out there, Keep reading, practice your reading. It's certainly very important. For everybody out there, I cannot stress enough how much I appreciate the courtesy and respect that you guys give. And for all of you out there, when you guys post things on these YouTube videos, comments, I don't respond to all of them, but I promise you I try to read them. And I will try my best once I get past this lecture series that I'm doing between now and the middle of August to spend some time answering more of these. Have a great day, everybody. See ya.